Welcome everybody to the Quantum Analyst Roundtable. No season, no episode, a little special guest interlude. I am joined by my friends, uh, Doug Fing, David Shaw, Shaheen Khan. James couldn't make it uh, uh, today. He also just started a new job and uh, that is keeping him busy. So send him your congratulations uh, on LinkedIn if you haven't done so yet. Doug, David, Shaheen, uh, how, how are you all doing? It's been a few weeks since, since we spoke. Everybody excited? Yeah. About <laughs> Excellent. You had all the news with the hurricane in Florida. We had a little bit of hurricane. Miami got very lucky. Uh, thank you for asking. Uh, got uh, got some extra time on filing taxes and, until February, so <laughs> that, uh, that was uh, helpful. So the, we'll, we'll be back with uh, season two, actually uh, recording that in two weeks, I believe, um, and, and it's been a, a few weeks that we're overdue. But uh, last time we talked uh, for a few minutes about uh, quantum machine learning, and uh, I was uh, very excited to read a YouTube uh, comment uh, on it by uh, uh, somebody that you will all know and recognize. And um, uh, that comment said, that, hey folks, the whole point of why we think generative adversarial networks will be a better near-term application of quantum devices is precisely, and now he goes into upper caps, you do not need to load data onto the quantum device. And uh, we thought that was, uh, uh, first of all, great to, to, to see that uh, uh, people are watching and giving us uh, feedback. And we thought, let's bring them on the show. Um, you know, we don't uh, claim to own the truth. Um, this is a platform for anyone who wants uh, to debate and, and show examples and, and arguments. So very excited to welcome uh, Christopher Savoy, CEO of Zapata Computing. I asked him not to do any advertising, but he gets around it with this beautiful shirt. Um, uh, tell us more, Christopher. Yeah, this is uh, our uh, work with uh, many people know with Andretti Autosport, which we do uh, the analytics for, uh, embedded with the team uh, using our using our platform. So uh, we're very much uh, excited about that, and maybe that's a topic for another uh, another day with the show. It is uh, fascinating. We got to talk about it for a couple minutes uh, while while preparing here. And uh, you brought uh, part of your team, uh, Alejandro. Please introduce yourself. What uh, what's your job at Zapata Computing? Hi everybody, I'm great to be here. I'm the research director of Quantum AI at Zapata Computing. So I'm leading basically all the efforts around QML, quantum machine learning, and yeah, so the software that we're building uh, for some of these key applications in the company. Great, uh, really good to have you. Uh, quantum machine learning is of course a, a very popular topic at Zapata Computing does a ton of uh, great work in it. Uh, and I think what, what we said, Doug, David, Shaheen helped me, but um, uh, we, we argued that one of the challenges is uh, working with the data and um, uh, that might be a bottleneck, right? Uh, can, can anyone maybe recall that conversation just uh, for a few seconds and, and kick us off? Sure, I can go first. Uh, basically, the, the, the mantra was that quantum computing is not for big data, uh, that it is not suitable technology if you have terabytes and gigabytes of data that you need to process, which sounds correct. It also is a question of, we all seem to agree that quantum computers are going to be an accelerator attached to other supercomputers and computers, often in the HPC world, where again, it's the marriage of heavy compute with heavy data, and that we might see the same movie again that we saw with GPUs that the transfer of data from the main computer to the GPU to process it and then to bring the results back needs to be worth the trip. And if it's gonna take you two days to get there, the only way it's gonna matter is that the processing you do had better take a lot more than two days. Uh, so that was those were the two challenges that we raised. And of course, when we say quantum machine learning, you say machine learning and machine learning over the past five years, we've learned that for machine learning, you need a lot more data than you thought you did. Suddenly, 100,000 pictures of cats aren't enough to train the thing. So that was really where the challenge came up in my head. And you know, David, please chime in. I, 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 was, I, was, I was keen to, to offer a perspective, which for me is, is really stepping, stepping back here. Uh, I think it's important to, to realize a bit of the history on this in, in quantum. Uh, and there's two bits of the history. One is what's happened on the, the traditional quantum side and one what's happened on the classical machine learning side. 
and the, the classical quantum side, one of the one of the great things that we built on in the quantum sector is a lot of great work that was done over many years by the quantum information science academics. And we, we owe them a, a continuing a continuing credit for the great algorithms that they built. But actually, all of their successes over maybe the last you know, 10 years now have tended to not be in the machine learning field. So up until relatively recent work. Uh, and literally, you go to, say, QIP, the leading conference, you know, a couple of years ago, and you would go along, and I must admit I did, to uh, the uh, the algorithms, uh, you know, workshop session on the day before the conference, and there's a four-hour training session on quantum algorithms. And you sit through four hours of really intense, very interesting stuff about quantum algorithms, and actually it gets to one slide at the end which says, oh, yes, there's also quantum machine learning. We don't really have very much about this. And that, that's, and I, I say that, but also you've got to credit the QIS guys for all the great stuff they have done, right? And then similarly, or, or not similarly, completely differently, over in the, the conventional world, you've got all of those entrepreneurs that have made AI, machine learning, happen. And, and actually, a lot of that's not really been, a lot of the breakthroughs have you know, not been the academic work per se. It's been people taking machines and saying, well, let's have a go then. And there's been tremendous progress. I, I, not, and it's not always got us to exactly where we want to be, but you can see the progress. And, and, and there's been a lot of money and a lot of interest that, of course, has followed that success. And so it's very natural for the field to come in then and say, hey, well, quantum machine learning, it would be great if these two things can go together. And that's that's very intellectually interesting it sounds like it should be fruitful uh, but it also is a way of generating and capturing interest so there, there is always a danger that we need to be robust in defending what we've then then done and for me i just come to that with a general backdrop of why there is such a an interesting debate here there's one other question that i i think we should also talk about and then we can turn over to the Zapata folks which is time frame you know, everyone's interested in quantum advantage and people always ask, what are the first applications that will go into production first using a quantum computer? And, you know, the question is, uh, will quantum machine learning be one of those first applications? Um, and, you know, people think that quantum machine learning has a lot of value, but we have to wait for the bigger machines. So with that, we can turn it over to the Zapata folks and they can uh, start answering our questions. Let's uh, turn it over. That uh, that was uh, our discussion a few weeks ago. And uh, Christopher, Alessandro, start where you want. You felt pretty strongly about your perspective. Also mentioned that there might be three myths about quantum machine learning that uh, deserve debunking. Um, what is your perspective? Yeah. So I, I think before we say quantum machine learning as some kind of monolith, let's break this down, right? Because I think that there have been some evolutions and there are maybe a couple of different categories of things that we all call mach quantum machine learning, but they're kind of different things, or at least nuantically and, and actually architecturally completely uh, different. You know, the, the first one was mostly machine learning with a little bit of quantum statistics, okay? Maybe that's one group, and people will call that, maybe that was the first foray into, into quantum. Then there's another form of this where the quantum model itself, okay? The, the, the modeling that you're doing of the data, the modeling that you're doing of the system, of the math that you're trying to solve is mostly quantum. And you you you, you, you provide, do some classical computing, some pre-processing, and then you let the quantum model do a lot of the, the, the work, right? And that's that's another category. But even in that case, and, and I'll let Alejandro uh, do the why of this, but even in that case, you don't have to load data necessarily onto the, the qubits themselves, okay? And then there's a third one that has progressed, and this is maybe Alejandro's you know, more recent work, if you've seen his last couple of papers and whatever, where uh, we're using mostly uh, uh, classical computing to do the stuff that classical computers are better at. So we agree with you. There are some things like quadratic equations. Why would you ever do that on a quantum computer? Ridiculous, right? Uh, but loading then, uh, part of the work uh, that the quantum computer is really good at, like tangled states, these kinds of things that that, that are really difficult to to replicate uh, classically. 
right? But then also post-processing back on the classical thing. So really basically a balance between the two and using the two in a, in, in a, in a means that, uh, that, that, that takes advantage of the, what each of these systems does better. Just like you don't use GPUs to do everything that a CPU can do necessarily, right? I think that that is also another paradigm that's like a third quantum machine learning. But when we talk about these things, everyone said the quantum machine learning, it's all three of those. And, and so there's some of that history. And when people go back to say, Scott Aronson's uh, post and he did a position paper from 2015, I think it was, where he said, oh, it'll never work because he can't load data onto it. He was talking about work that was in that first group of things I just mentioned from like 2008 to 2012. Right, there's been a lot of progress. And these other two types of using quantum devices didn't even exist back then when he was making those comments. So I think that this has led to some propagation of myths that were based on something that had truth to it, but based on a paradigm that uh, uh, was an older paradigm that's been like discarded mostly by the quantum machine learning community. So with that, maybe I can just turn it to, to Alejandro to talk about the, the, the three major myths here, one of which is loading data that we can talk about. That all three of those paradigms, maybe the first one, there's a little bit of loading data there, but in all three of those, you can do this without loading big data onto the quantum device. Nobody thinks that's a good idea. Nobody wants to do that. I just want to interject before Alejandro is that I was not aware of that uh, Scott Aronson paper, that everything I said was because of just what I was observing. So you just explained why I tend to agree with Scott so much. <laughs> so, thank you. Okay, and now we'll, we'll, we'll tell you why he was wrong. <laughs> or we think so. And we, we invite Scott uh, to, to come and uh, defend his, his, his Well, work. I think as you said, his comment, and I don't know the context of his comment, but it was a few years ago and things have advanced. So really the problem is really more me here right now because I continue to believe it and he may have moved on, of course. Well, it's also the framework of that, that, that statement it has to be taken within the context of what you're talking about. If you're not careful about definitions in this space, uh, you can get distracted pretty quickly and get the wrong idea. Sure, I think the challenge for me, and maybe you're gonna explain this, is that what part of quantum machine learning is can be formulated such that you can send just a few items of data yep. and do massive computation and get just a few pieces of data back and yep. say ah that was the answer That's that what i think is the crux and i know and i noticed your paper with entanglement now being sort of proven that you can reduce it or expand it so please explain that to us and kind of spoon feed it if you will yeah alejandro yeah, I just wanted to mention first that actually, well, there is nothing is actually particularly wrong about the paper and uh, from Scott. I think that the name of the paper, the title of the paper, it was a very popular paper. It's called Read the Fine Print. But I think the paper, that, as Christopher mentioned, is back in 2015, when actually the dominant contributions in quantum machine learning were in this space where actually you would use, for example, you would just quantize the classical known machine learning algorithms like support the vector machines, principal component analysis, you will have a quantum version of that, where actually, of course, I mean, you will need to load the data just to process it. And that's kind of like, he was referring because I mean, those, those type of algorithms back in the day, those are the only ones that had a claims about quantum advantage, that you could process things more efficiently and that they would have actually an advantage in the scaling. So, so the, the, the paper actually was referring to those first works in, in the field that actually, I think uh, uh, they don't still even, let's say, are part of this group of algorithms that Christopher was describing. So the part of algorithm, let's say the main bulk that Christopher was describing is, is the type of algorithms that we call hybrid quantum classical algorithms. And it's within QML. So the other algorithms are entirely mostly, well, the quantum computer is doing the whole heavy lifting. And for that, you need to load the data into the quantum device. So there are still, I want to clarify, because there are still even paradigms within QML that actually still require to load the data. For example, if you're doing supervised learning, that still requires to load the data or to embed the data into the classical so you can make classification. So I think into your question, I think Shaheen is, that's one of the reasons actually in, in the entire, I mean, I think I've been working in, in QML for the past uh, uh, eight years or so. We never worked actually in supervised learning and that was one of the limitations that we saw that we envisioned as well. That's why actually to answer your question, what could be one of those domains is actually where you don't have the need to load the data directly is generative modeling. Uh, I think Christopher was referring to that. The reason is because uh, in a generative model, 
what you care is about the model kind of like generating samples for you. Like at the end of the day, you actually, the task is not about actually loading and asking the model, can you classify this for me as it is in supervised learning. In the generative model, what is of value is the possibility of you generating new faces, new video clips, something that actually new art is actually is the possibility to generate it. And as long as you have a way to train the model and I have, for example, in the quantum model or assisting with a quantum model, then you are able to generate data. But notice that the data is not that you're going to load it before you classify. So that, that's a big distinction. And, uh, and that's one of the directions, all the research that we've done in the past in the team and even before when I was at NASA uh, uh, leading this quantum machine learning efforts, the, all the research has been only entirely on this field of generative model. So there are many reasons, and I will tap into some of the, em emphasizing why actually this is the, one of the most promising fields so, or for actually towards practical quantum advantage. So the first myth I think that we were referring is uh, that Christopher mentioned is about this loading the data. So I think as, as, as we know now, like there are different uh, shades of, of QML and uh, from, from all the way from the first paradigm that Christopher mentioned, where you just call the quantum computer once in a while, the other one where the quantum computer is actually the bulk of the model, and the other one where you have it immersed with the classical. So in, in none of these paradigms from the work that we've done in the past, actually, you need to load the data at all. So I think that that's one of the first kind of like uh, 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 methods up front, the kind of like that there are approaches it's just kind of like just to mention that there are ways to do this without actually loading the data. And the most recent paper, for example, that we had for the handwritten digits generation that used to actually leverage the power of GANs, it had actually a quantum component in it. We actually, we, we didn't need to load the, the entire, actually, the, the, the MNIST data set. We, 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 we needed to actually to train the model, but it's not part of actually loading to the quantum. So I think I saw you raise your hand. Yeah, so this almost sounds like Ab initio, for lack of a better word, is that you are actually generate. You know, you have the you have the you have the model already, and that model doesn't take uh, any input data, but then it actually generates all the data that it needs, and then it spews uh, out the answer at the end. Is that what you're saying? No, no, no. That's more like a, I would say more like a reinforcement learning approach where you can even start kind of like making artificial games and you generate everything from scratch. No, like what I'm saying is you still need the data but you don't need to load into the quantum device. So the myth is that you need to load into the quantum device. You always need data for any machine learning task. And for example, for the MNIST, of course, we still needed the 60,000 images that correspond to handwritten digits. But then the comparison of the data that comes at the classical, that, that comes actually completely in the, in, the, in, the classical, in the classical device. And for example, even, even back in the day, like the first algorithms that, they, that belongs to this paradigm one, when actually we were using just, in that case, it was the D-Way device, to just to calculate an expectation value that was complicated for the classical element model, you still need the data. You still need the data, but you do everything outside the classical computer. So actually you don't need to, you just need the quantum computer to compute that expectation value that is complicated. That it would take you actually, it would be very difficult to do otherwise. So, so mm -hmm. maybe I can break that down a little bit. Like in the MNIST data, right? You have, so a classification task uh, in some ways is simpler, but you use a lot of data to do that. Um, you're trying to determine, you know, uh, there's pixels in each one of these data sets, right? 700 pixels or whatever it is for, for one of those MNIST uh, uh, data. The, the classification thing would be, in some ways, trying to compress all of that data into, okay, is this a 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, okay? But the generative task is more about, uh, for a picture of a 7, okay? Do I need to know all the pixels and everything about them? No, I'm trying to extract from that uh, some nuances of what makes a seven a seven, right? What makes my seven different from your seven? What are the different features there? What are the different variables that correlate my sevens with my sevens and your sevens with your sevens? And trying to learn the different features that make up a seven. So how someone would draw a seven. So this could be maybe a 20 or 30 or 40 parameters, right? And, and, and it's about modeling those parameters and finding a statistical distribution that explains the correlation of those variables together. So we don't need all of the data to be loaded, the entire MNIST data with all the pixels and everything and all the numbers on qubits in order to make that calculation. What we're asking the quantum computer to do is to give me a probability distribution that will fit these things I'm already pre-computing in some way with the neural network that I have classically, right? To try and describe the different weights between these different variables, right? 
So learning that distribution is a very different task from trying to classify from all the data and all the pixels. So there isn't this need to take all of the problem and all of the pixels and calculate what it is that is a seven or whatever. It's a very different problem we're trying to solve. And what we're asking the quantum computer to do is give us a probability model that will explain some of these correlations that will help us explain. And we're doing a lot of the other calculation stuff classically. Do, do you follow what I'm saying? We're not loading I, all the data onto the quantum computer. I, I, I hope so. I hope I'm following. And I'll, 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 be, I'll be quick so others can uh, comment. So you are, it seems to me that you are simultaneously extracting more information out of the data that you have such that you can reduce it and say that you know this you know megabyte of data really only you know 50 bytes of it is all i need right yeah, we wouldn't say it's bytes but it's what what are Whatever. The, the, the correlations uh, right? yeah i'm just trying to make up some metric that 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 you know so you you take this mass of data and say i don't need all of this what i really need is just this you know, small fraction of that to do what I need to do. So that seems to be some non-trivial heavy lifting right there. And then B, what I'm ending up with is so computationally intensive that a quantum computer is needed to do it yeah. and happens to be good at it. Yeah, the, 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 the part that a quantum computer is really good at is doing probabilities, right? Sure. It's a probabilistic model. It's by its right. nature probabilistic. Right. So right. very complex. We had a Nobel Prize about this. Uh, probability distributions that violate the Bell inequality test, right? This, 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 this is something that's really hard to do on a classical computer. We can prove that it's intractable. Uh, you can't even do it because the physics of a classical system cannot do it, right? But that gives us a very rich probability distribution that's better explaining certain of these correlations and certain of these data. And it actually uh, finds these correlations in a different way. So that's your speed up. Your speed up is about getting the probability distribution. It's not about going through the data and trying to calculate the data, like doing some you know cost function analysis or whatever. Right, it's a fundamentally different approach to figuring it out, but uh, how much heavy lifting, how much computation does it take to look at that, you know, look at the image of a seven and say, these are the only 20 parameters I need, not the whole thing. Isn't that itself computationally intensive or is it not, or is it done once and you're done? That's something actually you have to do. And I think you put it very nicely, uh, Shaheen. And I think what we're looking here after is precisely what you mentioned. So you're distilling the information to get the complexity out of the problem when actually it becomes a, something hard and then you pass that to the device. And I think, I mean, this is this distillation of information in some way is done actually in every single data network, or at least in generative models, you always have the discriminator and generator. And what they're doing in some ways, compacting the information, like from these thousands or millions of pixels, a lot of information to actually to, to something that is more like we call this a latent space that is actually it's kind of like the abstraction that at the end of the day it represents digits uh, uh, certainly the classes of the digits so that's kind of like the abstraction and that abstraction is the difficult part and that's the one in some way that actually we're passing to the quantum device luckily for us i mean and i think if you look at the state of the art papers in, in generative models like while you can start with actually millions of pixels or thousands of pixels in, in most of these uh, data sets like the image net Actually, when they study this latent space, it's of the order of hundreds, or even at the order of tens. So actually, the number of neurons that you need in the latent space is actually way, way smaller. And actually, that's what they do actually already in the state of the art. So bypassing that complexity of using a neural network that actually people have been optimizing this for decades already, bypassing that, we don't want to bypass that. We actually want to leverage that piece. Because that's actually the third paradigm that, 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 uh, that Christopher was mentioning is you don't want to completely replace the entire thing by a quantum pen. You want to let the, the, the classical machine learning do the magic that they know how to do really well. And the intractable piece that is maybe capturing better the correlations of this abstract space that is not trivial to let the quantum computer do that piece. And that's what we did precisely in the paper where we replaced the classical component of that latent space, we replaced it with a quantum component, and we saw that there was a boost in the performance compared to the conventional GAN, if you would have done it only classical. So that's kind of like that the boost that we're trying to measure if to see if there was any value from the adding the quantum component in that in can, that, can, in that, in that can i can i come in on this because I, I think we're, we're talking we're getting to the heart of what one is one of, is one of the real questions here so we, we, we all agree in, in general that uh classical computers and quantum computers are, are good at different things you know even perfect quantum computers are only good at certain things and so we only really should expect to get some advantage if we're asking the quantum computer to do something that it's got a, a unique advantage to do. Um, and the question is, 
and, and of course we all believe well having a go is a great thing and, and we should work on different threads and everyone everyone supports that but we need to ask why are we getting an intuition that one particular way of, of working is going to give us an advantage and and what what i've just heard in in a, in a number of the, the the exchanges we've just had here is we've, we've threaded across some different potential reasons and i, I just wanted to reiterate the, the ones that uh, the ones that potentially work for me uh, 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 to give us to give us a list and and the one basic one is Oh, maybe the maybe the quantum computer gives us a speed up because it's taking some linear algebra we used to do and it's just doing it faster. And of course, that's what we thought the HHL algorithm. That's what the HHL algorithm does. If you've got QRAM and if that's all gone away, and that's what the big the fine print paper was all about. We know we're not pursuing that advantage anytime soon. No. So what? Why else might might a quantum component give me a, a benefit? Well, it might be that I'm going to capture. That, that larger computational space, the Hilbert space that the quantum computer gives. And, and to really to really firm up my intuition of why this particular use case problem is going to be able to, to, to take advantage of that, it really helps me personally if you can build a bridge as to why you need access to that big Hilbert space to do that, and, and that your approach really is leveraging that, right? I I think for that, and then, and then if I can just, can I just complete the, the list, Christopher? Because actually, this is this is the example you gave as well. My third type of example mm -hmm. is if there's something uniquely quantum about the statistics you're doing, mm -hmm. uh, and because I, I would maybe fine tune down your, your example. You said quantum uh, computers are great at pro quantum computers are great at quantum probability distributions. Uh, and it's a different type of probability distribution. So where we're dealing with some use case, some example where I need that, then again, it's very easy then to say, oh, I can see why a quantum computer is going to give me an advantage in that one. And you, you refer to where I need to model entanglement, et cetera, et cetera. So there for me are the three kings, you know, and one we know is, is probably out of immediate reach, uh, but show me that you're really making use of that Hilbert space or show me that you're really doing something with a, with some quantum statistics that need that and then 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 I, I, i'm getting a good in, intuition and, and then you might also say but hey there's some great things to try anyway because we think it might work and uh, i'd allow that as a fourth category in any circumstance anyway yeah i think that the, the latter two we're seeing here right i mean in the numerics of what you're doing you are using at the end of the day you're addressing a larger hilbert space that's why you are able to do this the hilbert space that includes a lot of other variables and correlations that you would not normally look at, right? So it's it's interrogating the space as a superset to what you can do classically within the same time frame. So you can call that a, a you know a speed up uh, in, in some sense. And some of the distributions are by their nature uh, uh, not addressable classically. They, we can prove that you just cannot do them with any classical simulation. Period. Full stop. Right. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can only look, and this is the second myth, I think, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean, and this is where people get, get at this wrong, and they, they've, we've seen people you know, with a good heart going down this path, that, well, then you need to have quantum data in order for the quantum distributions to be useful. Uh, and that's not also not correct. And, and maybe what I was going to interject with was uh, uh, Jens Eisert's uh, recent paper where he's showing with perfectly quantum uh, classical numerics that the quantum uh, methodology of applying to those numerics is better, is superior, and, and, and gives you, quote unquote, a speed up in, in, in finding these, these, these differences. And so, you know, uh, that, that maybe is also the second myth that's out there. Oh, if it's quantum data, then, then the third category that you're mentioning there will give us a speed up. But if it's classical data, we won't get a speed up. And, and that's maybe the second myth that's out there that, that is uh total bullocks in, in my viewpoint but uh but that's because it it, it it we've got actual data not just intuition to tell us that that's not it's, the case. Worth, it's probably worth actually the, what i described as the third category it's probably worth, it's probably worth explicitly breaking that into those two the two ones you you you, you mentioned it's not quantum data but it's got quantum uh, correlations in it that i need to access exactly. because actually that fourth one that you do where it's genuinely quantum data, of course that actually is an e well even more, it's, it's it's a very exciting one for the long term, yeah. and I think I mean a lot of us followed the the Google Caltech work at the end of last year, where they they did these 
um, uh, you know, learning from experiments uh, work. And, and that that was, a, for me, a very striking long-term uh, prospect. And why physicists love that is that you can mathematically prove with certainty that a quantum computer is going to do something quantum, natively quantum, and do better at it. Of course, okay? Nobody argues with that, all right? But our point is that there are things that you can use, that same methodology that give us quantum correlations, right? Quantum mm -hmm. statistics can be applied to classical data without loading the data to give us better answers in that classical machine learning context with classical data as an adjunct to mm -hmm. the methodology. And we're not saying throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, we're not saying throw out the, the, the classical. Let's actually use all of the great things that people have done in uh, classical machine learning to reduce that latent space, to compress that latent space. Why would we redo that on a quantum computer, right? If we're really good already at doing that classically, right? And it's arguably a better classical task, right? But then from that, in within that reduced latent space that we don't have to load every single thing on from the full data onto every qubit, we can now take some of that and transform that into uh, 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 work that can be done on qubits uh, much more easily and, and, and actually develop uh, an idea of what these correlations are much more intuitively, if you will, on, 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 on the qubit structure using that, that structure, that entangled structure that we have here to do the math on that. That's, that's what we're suggesting. So use each of these things for what they're good at, right? And let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. It is, in a sense, we're agreeing that, that this should be a, considered a, a, a quantum coprocessor, much like a GPU is used. That's how we believe the first uses will be. And, and, and the, the great thing about this is uh, one other nuance I think may be missing, and this may go to Doug's question here, is what do you, can you use this for? Yeah, generating better pictures for the, the, the meta, meta, metaverse, yeah, that might be great. I can draw a better couch uh, for my metaverse living room. Uh, but that's not the only thing we can use these generative models for. If you follow Alejandro's work here, and maybe you can describe some of that, you can use that same principle. Once you can find a distribution for anything, right? So for an example, for example, in one of his papers, we find the distribution for uh, 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 portfolios in the S&P 500. Okay, it's the same task, right? The, the, we use that same generative adversarial task to find that distribution, right? To, to hone in on what that distribution is. And we use the quantum computer to get even a better version of that, right? Now we apply that generative model to sampling off of that same distribution. So yes, I can generate a better couch, but I can also be generate a better stock portfolio or a better optimization routine for my uh, uh, refinery. Uh, chemi chemical engineering refinery, or a better uh, yellow flag prediction for Andretti Auto, Autosport. So that, um, that's a piece that you should not lose in this, that just because it's generative modeling, we're creating nice pictures in R. No, we can use these same principles to do some very useful things with generative adversarial networks that don't have anything to do with just generating pictures in R. Let's stick to this example of the seven for for just a minute, and you know, assume somebody wants to buy the best seven ever made uh, uh, from you. Uh, not not sure why, but that's that's what they want. You you very nicely explain how in the abstraction layer you already you know maybe have this um, uh, speed up. What else in a business context needs to happen to that seven uh, as a product that you deliver to that user uh, uh, for you to be able to say this this is the best seven? Yeah, well, the problem is the, the seven. Now, understand that MNIST is used by every classical machine learning person to test their algorithms against everyone else's algorithm. That's the reason we chose the data set, not because we think handwritten digits are, are uh, a super business-oriented thing. This is the standard for how you say that my algorithm is working better than your algorithm in the classical machine learning literature. Okay, so let's make that clear. We're not doing handwritten digits because we think that writing uh, forged handwritten digits is going to be a business model. Um, so I, I just want to clarify that for the audience. But um, that uh, we can create a better seven or a better whatever it is, like a better uh, portfolio or a better risk profile for my insurance or something like that. That can be useful, right? How do we prove that? It's heuristic. That's the problem here. What all we have is our uh, our prior and our posterior distributions to know whether we're doing well at the end of the day. 
And to your point about trial and error, why do machine learning people do that? They just try it. We shouldn't really make fun of that because at the end of the day, that's what you're doing with heuristics. All you have is your historical data that you use to train on. And all you can do is kind of use that uh, to predict how other outcomes might happen, right? So in the same sense here, we're pulling off of that distribution from what we've learned to find something that might be a better answer. But to prove it, it's heuristic. I'm sorry, you have to do it. Uh, you know, the proof is in the pudding. That's how this works, right? And so we use these things like MNIST and these other things to show within a structured output what our inception scores are compared to another algorithm, what is our inception score? So we can compare apples to apples because you're right, at the end of the day, the only way I'm gonna test my racing model prediction of tire degradation is to go to a race, put the prediction up and then make a decision based on it and see if I was right or wrong. That's the problem and the beauty of heuristics. Well, What's let me that? ask a question about, uh, just to clarify something for our listeners. I think it's important to understand there are several different types of quantum machine learning you know, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and specifically the technique that you guys are pursuing is generational adversarial networks, which is a very specific type of machine learning. And you talk about using probability, you know, uh, determining probability distributions uh, quantumly. Could that technique of, of figuring out the probability distributions be used on any of the other types of quantum machine learning algorithms? They can, uh, they can actually. So that is that is one thing. Um, uh, actually, so what we what we do actually is we don't focus on generative adversarial networks. That was one of the frameworks. But in reality, the, the domain that we work is generative models, and that includes actually many many other models like recurrent neural networks, autoregressive models, normalization flows. Now they have all kind of like there is there is a there is a huge kind of like family of generative models, and they all deal with the probability distribution. And one of the beautiful things about generative models is that in some way, the supervised learning tasks are a subset for the generative models. So just to, just to put in different words, while you can do discriminative task classification with generative models, you cannot do generation with discriminative models. So they're much more powerful, and that's why they're much more difficult. And that's why we feel those are the ones that are closer. If you want to, I mean, this is this is a perspective we wrote uh, like about uh, five years ago. It's called Opportunities and Challenges in Quantum Assisted Machine Learning, is we when I was back at NASA, uh, thinking with my with my PhD student, that actually he was an intern back at NASA, he's a computer scientist. So I think that that's good to ask the experts there, like what are the most difficult tasks for machine learning experts? And he was precisely pointing, and that's why we decided to settle on this one. This, this is one of the things that we find most attractive, this domain of generative models, is because if you're gonna look for, to, for quantum computers to make some damage somewhere, it should be what actually computer scientists are struggling. And that's why we chose this one. So just to differentiate to your question, yes, they you can do discriminative tasks with generative models, but you cannot do the opposite because they're not as powerful. And and the reason is mathematically is because in the in the discriminative tasks, you're focused only on the labels, ca ca capturing the labels or the things. In the other one, the probability is over the entire pixel space. You 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 need to be able to describe the data faithfully without actually even having labels that are guiding you to do this. So the that's, that's why I think that actually all this question and the question from, from David, I think they latch actually very well into the second and the third myth, and maybe I can combine them. And the second myth is about actually, it is, it is I mean, we, we hear this from students and researchers now that is the quantum computers are not good at classical ML. This is one of the myths that is kind of like, you know, and it's precisely motivated by this, by this idea that yes, quantum machines, they're, they, they should be good for quantum data. Even when we brought back the perspective, for us, it was obvious that yes, definitely quantum computers for quantum data, for quantum distributions, that should be a good match. And that should be something we should be doing, or at least in the field, that should be the lowest hanging fruit. But we don't have customers asking us, hey, can you characterize this quantum data for us? We have actually people doing portfolio optimization. We have all these applications. So the next question is, can we find the space within classical generative models where actually we can find some distributions that are efficiently representable by quantum models that are not captured well with classical models. And I think that's where the question is open. But we do know, at least from the from the scientific community, that there are some examples. Or at least, for example, Christopher was pointing to this example from ES Sciences, where he was pointing to this. It's contrived in the sense that it was the, the, the sample was tailored. It's a classical data set, 
but it was tailored based on the on factoring. So it's actually it's related to cryptography. And no surprise, I mean, he was using factoring, his team was using factoring because that's actually, we know that there is an advantage in factoring. So if you tailor, we you know that there are some distributions already that quantum would do well, that a classical computer would not be efficiently trained on those distributions. So we do know some examples. The question is, are there more distributions? And I think that's where it comes to heuristics. Um, and then the next question, I guess, that it goes to the third myth and to the question from David as well in the comments is, why is it even worth to actually try this? And the third myth that, that you see now in the in, in the days of people packing, I mean, one of the things of people why are not excited about QML is this reason that maybe it's only for quantum data. The other reason would be that they might say, this is the other myth that is classical machine learning, they're great. Actually, it is working well. And I think that's, that's, that's true. If you focus only your view on all the successes that come from supervised learning, and actually that's kind of like what we wanted to emphasize is that there is this paper from 2021 by Michaela van der Schaar from Cambridge, one of the lead uh, AI in, in the AI community, one of the lead professors in AI. And she was pointing precisely that in the case of generative models, we don't even know how to evaluate the performance of these models when it comes to being a model agnostic and domain agnostic uh, domain. So when you have actually these limitations, we don't even know how to classify the performance. So that's actually, that's what our research it's so challenging, but I think one of the things that I guess we've been putting forward is in one of the papers that we put recently is, can we even quantify this performance in the case of quantum versus classical models? So at least now we have a roadmap where we can put to compete classical and quantum models on the same footing in this particular task that are very challenging in such a way that we can play with the heuristics, but with a very foundational uh, approach where we can say, okay, quantum wins, classical classical actually is not, is not actually up to the point where actually we're with the quantum with the quantum model. So this is the first time that we can even ask this question because even evaluating the performance is extremely difficult. Now we have actually a framework, very solid framework. It was a paper that we recently posted this year, where actually at least you can you can you can you can ask this question: Is my quantum model doing better than the classical one? Before we didn't even have a way to answer this question because there was not even a framework to put this. Uh, it's very simple in discriminative models in supervised learning because you had the classification error and it's a it's very solid. In generative models, if I give you the picture of a cat and it look alike, hmm, is it actually a new cat or is it just copying the data? So it's very, very tricky to evaluate the performance of generated data. It's very, very subjective. Now we have a really quantitative approach where you can actually evaluate quantum and classical models. And I, I think, yeah, so that's kind of like the, at least the three myths that I think at least is, we call them myths, but in reality it's more like an invitation to be open, to be really to, to really kind of like an invitation that they, there are so many questions that we just don't know the answer. Like for example, like, it's a great question for David. I mean, what are these data sets that really have these quantum correlations? We just don't know. And I think, yeah, we, we, we're exploring heuristically. And we, for example, we did a paper on portfolio optimization where the tensor networks, the quantum inspired models were really outperforming GANs. That was a surprise. I mean, that's something that we didn't know. And now we're understanding why. Why actually this models that are built out of quantum states, at least on a conventional computer, why actually they have a good intrinsic bias for those distributions. And I think our bet is going to be in this type of discrete distributions. And they exist. I mean, portfolio optimization, which assets do you want to invest? I mean, you need to select out of the 500. Molecular discovery is another one. All the space of molecules and everything, you can actually, so those are discrete space that have a lot of value, even commercial. And we just don't know. I mean, we, we need, we need to throw the quantum models or quantum inspired models to check whether we can find a good match and, and the truth is that these models, the classical models in this domain, that is still very primitive. I mean, they, they, they've been mm -hmm. excelling in a lot of national language processing tests, but they're actually, they've been fine-tuned and there is a lot of resources. But for the most part, when you go to discrete distributions, they're very, very primitive. So that's kind of like, we, we need to find is a niche where actually the quantum computers can behave more actually, exploit this probabilistic nature of quantum computers and see if we can find a better way to describe the patterns of the data. And I have, it's I, have, I have a question that I'd be really interested to put to Alexandro and, and, and Christopher, actually, on a, on a slightly wider point around this. Um, you know, the, the, the hardware vendors out there, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a split in the market. You know, some are emphasizing straight to you know, FTQC. Some are saying, oh, no, we want to build devices for NISC. Some see it as a route that will go through NISC and, and ultimately get to FTQC. But, but one of the things that informs is what types of features they're prioritizing building into their devices. And, and one of the things that's, uh, for me, very, very uh, notable is, is you've got a, 
you know, you've got a real focus on adding more functionality around the circuit description languages we've got access to. So, for example, what's happening with Open Chasm 3.0, what IBM call, you know, their, their dynamic circuits, uh, and, and, and similar features that have been available on other platforms like mid-circuit measurement, things that you've been able to do on Regetti devices for some time. And I'd be really interested, particularly when you, you, you focus on this challenge of how can I uh, implement an expressive circuit for this mid piece in your hybrid your hybrid algorithm what's useful to you there actually does it does does does, does that extra dynamic classical logic help or, or not really for this task what 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 kind of features do you need in in next generation hardware i i think you first have to say yeah lower error is better so any features that can uh mitigate error uh, obviously will help, even in, in the context of a heuristic. It just means <laughs> fewer iterations, right? Um, so obviously, any any kind of work that we can do to reduce error, reduce error, um, reduce circuit depth, uh, all of these things that we're doing as far as improvements go, I think matter. Now, some of these things like uh, mid-measurements and these things are less relevant in this context, I think, because you're taking the output of the, the, the complete circuit. For the most part, Alejandro, correct, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I mean, you're not concerned about each individual parameter and whether you have this gate or that gate as much, right? That's kind of being generated as part of the task here. But, uh, but I think that the general movement towards fault tolerance and towards these kind of er strongly error-mitigated regimes is definitely helpful. Uh, and definitely useful, and and fewer errors will give us better results even in this regime because we'll have better statistics at the end of the day. Would be my first answer to that. And then, okay, if we're going to actually do machine learning on the quantum model itself as the, the learning mechanism, then actually fault tolerance helps uh, quite a bit. Um, there's more flexibility there, obviously. But I think if your question is, can we do stuff without getting to fault tolerance? Certainly, I think. And uh, Alander, we were just talking about what kind of estimates we wanted to put out there, but I think we were saying like, yeah, we hate to put numbers on this kind of stuff, but uh, but kind of ballpark, you know, a few hundred qubits, and we're in really good territory to do stuff that provably we're not going to be able to do uh, 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 classically here. I think. Yeah, well, I the think, other question uh, was, what sort of capabilities? are useful as you code this what sort of transformations or dynamic re right reformulation well, yeah yeah so that that's actually it, it is an art actually when you're designing this hybrid quantum classical algorithm it's not as easy actually in the perspective paper that we wrote actually we put this framework very abstract still i mean we used kind of like one 1980s model from from jeff hinton where actually it's called Helms machine where you can actually replace the quantum component for the last the last layer and actually, yeah, so even going to the GANs, there's a lot of work that you still need to, to, to do for actually deciding, okay, does it make sense here to insert a quantum component? And, and the first, I mean, the first criteria is, is, is of course, I mean, would it actually the quantum would add any value? Is that actually something that, for example, this abstract representation of the data is something that is difficult? And then it's been explored that actually changing that, that latent space, it helps. Uh, but yeah, but definitely going back also to the question uh, related, definitely quality of the device is one of the essential pieces here. If we are still talking about the NISC, kind of like Christopher was mentioned 500 or something like that. I mean, for example, with 500, we can already explore the SP500, at least with our approach that is hybrid. And of course, I mean, all that requires is that you can train this device, that you can actually do the, do the, the, the actually the, it to deliver the entanglement and the distributions that actually are unique for quantum. And that requires, of course, a, a significantly level of entanglement, and that's, that, is, that is all tied to the quality of the qubits. So definitely, quality of the device is something that is that is very important. There is one last thing that I wanted to add, and we posted a paper super recently, like a month ago. Actually, we think we're super excited because I think this is the, maybe the shortest path to quantum advantage. It's actually it's a shortcut. It's actually you don't need to, as Christopher was pointing, you don't need to throw the baby uh, with the water path. So it, so basically, what we are doing there is you are using the classical model, in this case, a quantum inspired tensor network. You pre-train, you try, you attempt to solve the, 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 the problem with your classical model. And then starting from that point, then you spice it up with quantum gates in such a way that you add these non-trivial non correlations. And we saw a huge actual enhancement, not only in the expressibility of the model, in the terms of solving better, giving a better quality model, but at the same time, actually mitigating one of the most important challenges that we have in QML, that is the trainability of the quantum circuits. Once you start putting all these gates in these models, actually 
you suffer from these barren plateaus that actually the landscape become nasty and it's very flat and it's very difficult to move. By doing this pre-training, you basically, you're putting the quantum in a good spot to actually to do the magic that it needs to do, to just to, to take the extra mile. So I think this is, this is, this is a, a very kind of natural framework that all the race for quantum advantage up to now has been a zero sum game. It's been either quantum wins or, 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 or classical or classical wins. So it's kind of like this race between China and the Google supremacy experiments and all of this about, oh, I have a better device now that I can do this in 40 seconds. All this race is about quantum or classical wins or lose. Here we're saying, no, I mean, I think yeah, actually the best way is there is a lot of technology going into the classical models. Use it as far as you can. And then when you're stuck, actually turn on the quantum, quantum component. And we found a way to do this in the context of this needs to, to near full tolerant type of routine with these devices where you can compile what you had in the classical model, compile it into the circuit and then turn the quantum magic afterwards. So that's kind of like what we feel is one of the most near term approach to how to leverage these small devices in, in interesting and hard, uh, hard generative model that is actually it's very difficult for classical models. Fascinating uh, discussion. We're, we're running out of time uh, again. Uh, we could go on for, for a long time. We learned and clarified uh, a lot. And, and at the same time, we don't have all the answers yet. You do not need to load the data onto a quantum device. Uh, classical does that better and probably will for, for a long time. But when it's uh, about defining these attributes of that seven, uh, we start to see some uh, quantum advantage there uh, potentially. Of course, nobody except maybe in the metaverse will buy that seven, but um, creating these images is the accepted performance benchmark test um, uh, for this type of application. Uh, so this is a really, really interesting work. And as we now productize that for other business uh, use cases, uh, we, we have to test it um, and, and, and see what we come up with. Um, uh, hopefully that is uh, the gist of what we learned today. We'll do any closing statements no more than 10 20 seconds uh, uh doc uh anything on your your side well i just wanted to give compliments to the zapata team for some of the blogs and the videos that are on their website because i did review it before this i think they were quite clear and i certainly would recommend any any of our uh, listeners to go to that website and look at them because they're very educational and uh, you'll find a video about uh, a partnership with uh, andretti sports since you're wearing the shirt, uh, Christopher, and the hat, uh, maybe the most fun use case in quantum, but it's not all fun, it's also business. Absolutely, yeah, and uh, catch us up on uh, track next year. Uh, hopefully, uh, we'll see some quantum advantage in, in racing. <laughs> Beautiful, the, there, there are no yes or no answers in quantum, no black or white. Uh, it's a, a long, long discussion, and we will continue to go round and round and round, uh, not just on the racetrack with uh, Zapata and Andretti, but uh, also at the Quantum Analyst uh, Roundtable. This concludes our QML special with Zapata Computing. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you, Alessandro, for these uh, fantastic explanations. And we will see you in a couple of weeks with season two of the Quantum Analyst Roundtable.